soul, evolution, and earthly success. Satan, Satan's purpose, as we talked this morning, is to deceive people. The best minds to deceive is young people. Especially people that get into school, and usually grade schoolers think their mother and father are smart. But when kids get to high school, they think their mother and father is rather stupid. You know? And at this time, they get to college, and they think their professors are smart. And their fathers and mothers are ancient people that don't know anything. And Satan has used the public schools as his launching point to deceive young people's minds. Our school systems belong to Satan. More and more people are homeschooling for that very reason. My son has never sent any of his kids to a public school. He says he don't want them to go to public school. In Alaska, many of our brethren are homeschooling. They don't teach them. They don't send school anymore. Because of all the trash that's being taught in schools today, Satan controls our school systems. From the time that they begin, from kindergarten on, they're taught that evolution is a fact. They don't question. Evolution is a fact, is the way they teach it. Never ever been proven. It can't be proven because it's a big lie. But that's what our children are taught from the time they enter school until they get out of school. They're taught, as we talked about this morning, about universalism. You accept every religion as being able to save people or tolerance. Everybody's got the right to think what he wants to think. He's just as good. His opinion is good as mine. And that's true, like I said. It's true. His opinion is as good as my opinion. But we don't live by our opinions. We live by God's word. And that makes all the difference. If it's opinions, then anybody's opinion is as good as another person's opinion. But God took that right out of our hands and said this, that the standard is God's word. He says, in the wisdom of God, in God's wisdom, man's wisdom knew not God. It was by the foolishness of preaching that God was pleased to make man know his will. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 21. In God's wisdom, man's wisdom can't find God. Because in God's wisdom, he made all men equal. All of us equal. None of us knows God. All of us are sinners. And the only way to get back to God is through the gospel. Jesus goes to the house of Martha and Mary in Luke 10, in about verse 38. Martha comes to Jesus and says, Don't you care that my sister's left me to serve alone? Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're troubled and comfort with many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen the better part. Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and listens to Jesus. Says, she's chosen the better part. If you don't learn anything from last night, today, tomorrow, or how long I'm here, if you don't learn anything, remember one thing. One thing is needful. Whatever happens, only one thing is needful. Whether you live healthily for a hundred years, or whether you get cancer and die at a young age, or whether you have a wreck and die, nothing makes any difference. Because we're all going to die anyway. But one thing's needful, and that's being right with God. 
other than that, it makes no difference. Paul says, we think not uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He said, we think not. Though our outward man is decaying day by day, yet is our inward man being renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is for the moment, worketh for us a more and more eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. If you can see it, it doesn't have much value. Anything you can see with these eyes has very little value. Because it's just passing away. At this time, we have people in Afghanistan. Ruben's brothers there now. Three others are our members from the Valley Church. are there now. And we're concerned with these people. That they might get killed there. And I don't want to diminish anything that they're doing. But that's not important. I fought the Vietnam War. And most of my friends got killed in Vietnam. But it doesn't make any difference. Because you're all going to die anyway. Whether it's today you die or tomorrow you die, or next week or next month or next year, it doesn't make any difference, you're going to die. Because that lasts eternally. Satan wants us to look at today. Just grab everything you can get today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just get it today. And he blinds the eyes of the people, especially young people. He's deceiving the young people. Satan has one goal, and that's to kill everybody and take us to hell with him. And God, from the very first, tells us one thing is needful, and that's being right with God. The very purpose of this whole book, the purpose of this whole book, the very purpose of God, to the extent that we know God, we don't know much about God now. The hidden things belong to God, the things that are revealed belong to us and our sins, that we might live according to His will. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. A lot of things about God are hidden that we don't know. But things that He did tell us is all for salvation. Everything that Jesus did laid aside his deity. Everything Jesus did, he did for our salvation. Jesus goes to heaven and sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us. The Holy Spirit guides us and leads us. We walk according to his word. And all of it is for our salvation. This whole book was written for our salvation. One reason. Save souls. Genesis 3.15 Eve and Adam had eaten of the fruit that God forbid them. And immediately God appears. He talks to Adam first, he blames the wife. Talks to Eve second, she blames the snake. Nobody wants to accept responsibility for what we're doing. Jesus says, you'll give account for what you do. And then he said in 315, speaking to Satan, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed, and he will bruise your head, and you'll bruise his heel. 
As soon as sin came in the world, God said, I'll fix it. Because man can't do anything about it. Sin is what man do. And once a man sins, there's nothing he can do about it. It's totally up to God. God has to fix it. So from that point on, everything in this book is the scheme of salvation. Everything is the scheme of salvation. Why do you read, if you read in Genesis, you get to Genesis 5, and what do you read in Genesis 5? Adam beget, Cain, Cain beget, and it, and it puts you to sleep. What is all that for? You get to chapter 10, you go through the whole same thing. You get to chapter 7, then you go through the lineage of Noah and his sons. What is all that for? Because God said, the seed of woman will bruise Satan's hand. And he starts from the seed of woman and he follows one line through that whole Old Testament so that we know when Jesus is born, that's the seed line. That's the one that's going to bruise Satan's hand. That whole Old Testament is written so that you can know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that you can have eternal life. Everything is about souls. Nothing is important except souls. This morning we mentioned James 2, 26. Use it for a different purpose to show that faith without works is dead. But he starts that passage by saying, body without the spirit is dead. Which tells you that before long your spirit's going to leave this body and this body's going to be dead but that spirit's going to live eternally. You will never die. You're not going to live here long. I'm in the mid-70s. And I have friends that's in the mid-80s. And some of you young people might die before us. You have no promise on this lady, but you have an eternal promise. In fact, you are going to live eternally, whether you do it in the fires of hell or the glories of heaven. One thing is needful. Be sure you hang on to that. Satan's going to do everything, especially you young people. He's going to do everything to blind your eyes from that one purpose. <laughs> After the flood, God comes to Abraham. And he tells him in chapter 12 that he's going to bless Abraham but he doesn't bless Abraham just for Abraham. He says in verse 2, Be thou a blessing. God blesses us for the purpose of us being a blessing to all those around us. That's what we talked about this morning. We are debtors. Therefore be prepared. And don't be ashamed of the gospel. God, Jehovah, comes to Abraham. He says, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. When he offers Isaac in chapter 22 of Genesis, after he offers Isaac, God appears to him and he says in verse 18 of chapter 22, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What's God interested in? This whole book is to save souls. Because souls are never going to die. Our soul is in a fleshly body just for a little while. And we're in this fleshly body for one purpose. And that's to prepare for our privilege of leaving this earth and being with God. But there's only two places to go. If you're not with God, you're going to be with Satan. He told Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He says three things. In thy seed, all the nations will receive a blessing. 
Galatians 3.16 tells us that the promise that God made to Abraham and unto his seeds, he says, not seeds of many, but unto thy seed, which is Christ. The seed of Abraham that is going to bless all the nations is Jesus. If you're going to get any blessings, you're going to get it in Jesus. In thy seed, Jesus, all the nations will be blessed. All the nations. Throughout the whole Old Testament, according to the Jew, the only person who could be saved was a Jew. Us Gentiles were just put here for the fires of hell. To the Jews. But God told Abraham, clear back there, 2,000, maybe 2,500 years before Christ, that all the nations are going to be blessed in his seed. He tells all the nations in Acts 3. After Pentecost, Peter's preaching, heals the, the uh, lame man. All people come together, and, and Peter preaches. And he tells them in verse uh, 24, And all the prophets from Samuel and David follow spoke of these days. Everything in the Old Testament is summed up in these days, the days of the Messiah, the days of Christ and his kingdom. And unto you, he goes on in verse 25, Unto you, speaking Jews, is the promises of the covenants. And you are the seeds of Abraham, and whom he said, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He quotes Genesis 22. That's the Jews. But he says, All nations. And in Galatians 3 8, it says, The scriptures foreknew that God would bless the Gentiles. He spoke before in the scriptures of God blessing the Gentiles, saying what? In thy seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. So in Acts 2, uh, 3, 25, and in uh, Galatians 3, 8, he quotes Genesis 22, 18, showing that the fact that God promised to Abraham is being fulfilled in all the nations. In thy seed, Jesus, shall all the nations, Gentiles and Jews, be blessed. What's the blessing? <coughs> Acts 3, 26. Unto you first, speaking of Jews, God raised up his servants and sent him to bless you in returning everybody from the sins in Jesus. And Jesus only, everybody returns from their sins. Because the character of God is love. God is love. You know, before God created the earth, he knew everything. Before God created the earth, he prepared our salvation. 2 Timothy 1.9 tells us he saved us. God ended up in verse 8 before. He saved us. And called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth. Before all the foundation of the earth, God saved us. But was manifest by the appearing of Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. God prepared everything for our salvation before he created anything. As far as God's concerned, Christ died before the foundation of the world. That's the reason throughout the whole Old Testament, God could forgive sin. Under the Mosaic law, they offered sacrifices. When they offered by faith the sacrifice God commanded, God forgave their sins. Did God forgive their sins on the on the effect of the sacrifice? No. Hebrews 10, 4 tells us the blood of bulls and goats can't save them. God washed their sins on the basis of the blood of Jesus who God knew before the foundation of the world. How do I know that? Because God told me. 1 Peter 1, 18. You're redeemed. Not with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain manner of life handed down for your fathers, but with precious blood. 
as of the blood of a lamb without blemish, without spot, even the blood of Jesus, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world. But was manifested in these times for your sake. God didn't have to wait till AD 33 when Jesus crucified on the cross to know Jesus died for all men. God is not bound up in time like we are. God sees time in one flash. He sees it all. He sees the last day as well as he saw the day he created Adam. God knew before there was a man on earth who would sit here in this audience today. Because God knows everything. And all of God's purpose from the creation on is to save souls. If we're not involved in saving souls, boy, we're prostituting our lives. We're selling ourselves cheap for something that's not according to the purpose of our life. God and everything we know about God is for the purpose of saving souls. He says in 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness. So God is love and God is light. Jeremiah 31, 3 says Jehovah loves you with an everlasting love. Therefore, he has called you in loving kindness. Jeremiah speaking before the fall to Babylon. He's prophesying that Babylon's coming. He's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. He's going to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. If God loves you with an everlasting love. Men have fallen in sin, are wicked and sinful, degraded people, and God loves us. Not because we, we are anything to draw us up, but because God is love. God doesn't just love us. God is light. In him is no darkness. And God's purpose is to save mankind. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not slack concerning his purpose, as, men, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. Well, ago, I spoke of the fact that Christ died before the foundation of the world beside God. God, uh, Jesus, God, through Jesus, has paid the price for every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed. It's already paid for. Already paid for in 1 Peter, no, 1 Timothy 2. He starts in verse 1, the prayers and supplications of thanksgiving be made for all men, for kings and those in high places. That you might live a grand thrill and a quiet life with all gravity, and godliness. For this is well pleasing unto God who would have every man be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, himself man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. Jesus died for all. Ever sin that any man on the face of this earth has ever been has ever done or ever will do is already paid for in Jesus. He paid for it all. He took it all to the cross. <laughs> Titus 2.11. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. 1 John 2.2. 2. For he is our propitiation, and not for ours only, but for all the world. God's purpose is to save souls. Jesus' death is to save souls. Our life in Jesus is to save souls because all man's sin have been paid for. Salvation has been prepared for every man. He just needs to come accepted by being obedient to Christ. It's already paid for. Everybody walking around out there that don't know Jesus, his sins are already paid for. But it'll do him no good until he comes to Jesus and is washed in the blood of the Lamb. That is God's sole purpose is to save mankind. Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel taken in the second deportation in 597 B.C. from Jerusalem to Babylon. He's prophesying in Babylon. Jeremiah's prophesying in Jerusalem. Both of them saying the same thing. God's going to destroy Judah for its iniquity and its sins. Going to wipe out Jerusalem and destroy the temple. And in all that, Jeremiah said, Jehovah loves us with a everlasting love. Ezekiel says in chapter 18, verse 23, has Jehovah any pleasure in the death of the wicked? And not rather that they would turn, that they may be saved? The last verse of the chapter 32, he says, Jehovah has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So, turn and be saved. Even at the point where God is going to destroy them, he says, I still want you. God wants you. God wants everybody. He wants us all to be saved. Therefore, when Jesus comes in time and makes a sacrifice for all people, then Jesus, when our things are accomplished, he hangs on the cross, John 19, verse 28 through 30. When he knew all things were finished, he said, I thirst to give him a drink. Verse 30 says, when he knew all things were finished, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He has now made atonement for all men everywhere in every age, every nation, every color. And Jesus says, all authority is given me on heaven and earth. Go ye. Therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, them disciples, to observe all things whilst I arrive to man and you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of life. Jesus said, I came and brought the salvation which was God's intent before the creation of the earth. Now you go and make disciples of all nations. And those that are baptized, you commit the same commission to them. In Mark 16, he says the same thing. Verse 15. Go ye and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Because of the condition of men is all sinners. We're all equal. There's only Two types of people on this earth. Saved sinners and lost sinners. We're all sinners. But because of Jesus, there can be a saved sinner. All are sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 All are sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's the condition of mankind. <coughs> Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake their ways. On God. The soul is the only thing important. Nothing else is important. All the heathens are lost in darkness and they're without excuse. He says in Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God has been Revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness to men that hinder the truth and unrighteousness. For that which is known of God is manifested unto them because he manifested them to them. For the invisible things from the creation, the invisible things of him, since the creation are clearly seen through the things that are made, being perceived through the things that are created, even his everlasting power, and divinity that they may be without excuse. God said his wrath is shown to show people who God is. When you have the tsunamis,
when you have the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the droughts and the storms and the floods, God said, I did it to show people my wrath against wickedness. But people are too dull to understand what God's doing and why he's doing it. God's doing it to save souls. God sent judgment after judgment on Judah and Israel to get them to wake up. The book of Revelation, God sends judgment, partial judgments of trumpets. The trumpets of chapter 6 and chapter 7. Trumpets are warnings. <coughs> 6 and 7 are the seals. 8 and 9. 8 and 9. He says seven trumpets, those are warnings to get them to repent. If you read those, he judges a portion, not the whole thing. And all of his judgments are to get people to repent. And he says in verse 20 of chapter 9, they repented out of their wickedness. Therefore, guess what's going to happen? Chapter 16, the bones of wrath, God wipes out Rome. Because they were too dull to understand the purpose of his judgments. America today is getting ready to fall. He sends us judgment after judgment. He sends hurricanes. He sends volcanoes. He sends earthquakes. He sends floods. And what do we do? We let the president tell us that those are things from nature. He missed the whole point. He's too dull to have a clue who God is. God said, I send those things to get your attention to repent, and you stupid Americans aren't doing it. Guess what happened to Judah when they didn't listen? Guess what happened to Babylon? We don't Persian, Greek, and Rome because they didn't listen. Guess what happened to all the nations from then to this day who don't listen? Where are they today? They're buried. Because they didn't listen. And America is doing the same thing today that every one of those nations are doing. And God still wants your soul. He sends the bowls of wrath and wipes out everything. Jesus came to save souls. He says, we go back to Romans 1. Where we go to? Verse 20. Verse 21, he says, For that they, knowing God, gave not God the glory, nor did they give him thanks, but they became vain in their reasoning, and in their senseless minds became fools. Proclaiming themselves to be wise, they become fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God unto the likeness of the image of corruptible man. Birds of the heaven, four-feeted beasts, and the bird, and the creeping things. He says in 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the creature rather than the creator. Why did they do that? Because, verse 19 says, they knew God because he was manifest in their heart. Why did Buddhism come along? Why did Brahmism come along? Why did Islam come along? Because man is incurably religious, but he refuses to acknowledge God, therefore he makes his own religion. And Satan wins. God wants souls. That's the reason God wrote this whole book. That's the reason for all the activity of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, as far as we know, is for the salvation of souls. That's the reason Jesus washed each one of you in the blood of Christ so that you would save souls. You have no other purpose to live it. I don't care where you work. You work there so the people around you see Jesus. Wherever you go, whether you buy or sell in the markets, you're there so the people around you see Jesus. 
We do what we do because we serve Jesus. Matthew 10, 24 and 25, I mentioned last night, a disciple is not above his teacher, neither a servant above his master. It is enough that the disciple be as his teacher. That's Jesus. And that a servant be as his master. Everything he tells us is telling us be just like Jesus. Take on the image of Christ. Paul tells us be ye imitators of me as I also am of Christ. We spoke this morning about Paul himself. He said though he was free from all men, he made himself in bondage to all. To the Jew, to those under the law, to those without the law, to the weak, to the strong. Jesus said, Paul says, I become all things to all men that by and by all means my save son. I do all things for the gospel's sake. And then he says, be ye imitators of me. We need to be doing all things for the gospel's sake. Satan is deceiving our young people. Our taxes are supporting teachers to deceive our children. Teaching evolution as a lie. He's not teaching as a lie. It is a lie. There is no way to prove evolution because it's unprovable. It is not scientific. It's Satan's lie. When I teach a Buddhist in Thailand, I start off by, I used to start off by trying to show them evidence that there was God, and you would say, okay, there's a God, but we have our own belief. So then I went back and started understanding that they've got to understand what they believe has no basis. Start teaching people by asking them three questions. Where'd you come from? What are you here for? Where are you going? And then we talk about what the Brahmins taught about that, what the Buddhists teach about that, what evolutionists teach about that, and what Christ taught about that. Where'd you come from? What are you here for? And where are you going? Everybody needs to consider that. Huh? Where did you come from? Did you come from a dumb monkey? That's what Satan wants us to believe. And Satan's inspired all the teachers in our schools to teach that. Where'd you come from? If there's a God that created, you better get lined up with that God. What are you here for? For that purpose that we've been talking about for a couple of days now. One purpose. One thing is needful, don't you forget that statement. That's Luke 10, 42. You need to raise that. One thing is needful. Evolution is a lie. Then I ask him, after we discuss where we come from, what we're here for, what we're doing. Everything has to have a source. We're talking about evolution. Evolution says we just started with a cell or heat or some chemicals and they got together and they formed life on that one cell, a single cell that had life and then it goes through the, from fish to half fish and just, okay, uh, uh, alligators and crocodiles and those people and those things. They finally come into monkeys and so forth and comes on to people. Over millions of years, changing a little at a time, meaning we came from nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. Everything has a source. Everything has a reason. If you have a wreck out there, there's a reason you have that wreck. 
Nothing happens that doesn't have a reason, doesn't have a cause. Everything has a cause. Everything has a reason. And God is that reason. Nothing comes from nothing. We can wait right here for another 5,000 years and nothing will come from the nothing that's right there. Evolution has no answer. Evolution has to say, well, there was always matter. Well, where did the matter come from? They don't answer that. I took geology in college one year because I'd worked in the oil fields out in Kimball, Nebraska when they had a big boom out there. So I was interested in geology. I took geology courses. The professor was dumb. <laughs> had a doctor's degree and he tried to tell us that matter always was. Listen, you've got to make God eternal or matter eternal. But you can't make matter eternal 